Um, hi and welcome to my understanding of deafness or MUD. Uh, my name is Sue Muir and I am one of the teachers of the deaf here in Wolfham Forest. Uh, this is an online course for our secondary age students and it aims to give you a better understanding of your deafness and all the things that come along with having a hearing impairment. Um, we have delivered this course in school so some of you may have already attended but this would be a really good um, refresher if you have. Um, we've um, we have been creating a um, version for primary age students and that will be with us really soon. In part one, we'll be looking at the ear, how it works and what can go wrong. Uh, we'll discuss the different types of hearing loss and we will be looking at some of the audiograms. So throughout this presentation, I may use words such as deaf, hearing impaired, having a hearing loss, hard of hearing or something else. Um, and all of these words are to describe someone who has a reduced level of hearing. Um, but, but maybe sort of think about how do you describe your hearing loss? Um, you know, part of the reason for, for running this course is that we find with a lot of our secondary students that actually you guys find it quite difficult to explain to other people about your hearing loss, even the sort of terminology, even the words that you might use to describe it. Some people use the word deaf, other people don't like the word deaf um, because it makes it sound as if you can't hear anything when actually maybe you can hear quite a lot. Um, some people use hard of hearing because then you don't have to sort of say that you're deaf or that you have a hearing impairment or a hearing loss. Um, so sort of maybe while we're talking through uh, this presentation have a think about how you describe your hearing loss and you know as I said part of the reason why we're running this course is that with a lot of our secondary students we find that you don't always fully understand what your hearing loss is and, and what that means and maybe what you can and what you can't hear um, or what an audiogram means or what a sensory neural hearing loss is um, and you might have read all of these things on a, an audiology report um, and it'd be quite interesting to know what all of those things mean. And hopefully by the end of this um, presentation, you will start to have sort of a better idea. So how does your ear work? So your ear is made up of three parts. You've got an outer ear, a middle ear and an inner ear. So the sort of areas to look at, we have um, our ear canal, we have our eardrum, we have our three small bones called your ossicles, they're the smallest bones in your body. We have a second little eardrum here and then we have this snail-like structure here called your, your cochlea. Then from going from your cochlea you have your auditory nerve which goes up to your brain. So when we're thinking about sound and, and how we hear sound, particularly speech, sound will enter our ear canal as, as a sound wave. So hopefully you might have done a little bit about this in science. So the sound will pass along your ear canal as, an, as a sound wave. So what that wave does is it will tap and it will move your eardrum slightly. Um, that in turn, move your very small bones here, your ossicle, now they sit together, not quite touching each other, okay, and they have a very important job. As the sound comes in and it taps your eardrum, those bones need to tap together so that they can continue the sound wave. That will then tap on this small eardrum here. Then what happens is your cochlea is a bit like if we imagine a piece of garden hose, piece of hose pipe, you roll that up, you would have a space inside and your cochlea is very similar. It's about the size of your thumbnail, your cochlea, and it has this space inside and inside that space are all your tiny hair cells and you also have some liquid in there. So when this inner eardrum is is moved that in turn will move the liquid inside this space that will cause your hair cells to move 
they will produce a signal that will then go through your auditory nerve and up to your brain. And it's actually your, your brain that tells you what you're hearing. So your ear really is just an instrument to get that sound up to your brain. And it will be your brain that says to you, that was the doorbell ringing or that was somebody sort of calling my name. We have some other things here. So these semicircular canals here, they help with balance. So when you sort of bend over to tie up your shoe and you stand up, there's some liquid inside your semicircular canals. And when you move that liquid around, that's what makes you feel dizzy. And when you stand up and that liquid then settles back where it should be in your semicircular canals, then the dizziness sort of goes away. So as you can imagine, there is quite a lot within your ears that can go wrong. So if we look at some of the things that might happen or what you know might cause a hearing loss or a hearing impairment. So if we look at this sort of part of your ear here, this bit that sticks out, it's called your pinna. And it does have a very important job. It sort of helps to collect sound and sort of channel it down your, your ear canal. So obviously if there's any sort of damage that's happened to your pinna, that might make it more difficult for you to collect the sound that you need to collect. Um, then you may find that you have got a narrow ear canal. We have certain students that have very narrow ear canals, or some people might not actually have an entrance into their ear canal, so there might not be a hole here, or that for some reason the ear canal structure just hasn't formed properly, which obviously will make it difficult for sound to pass down into your sort of middle ear. So following along this ear canal, the next thing that could, um, which could potentially have problems is your eardrum. So some people have had a perforated eardrum, which means that you, you have a small hole in your eardrum, which means that your eardrum then doesn't move in the way that it should. So anything that might obscure your eardrum, even wax, um, you know, when we have a lot of wax in our ears, that stops the sound from being able to get to the eardrum. Behind your eardrum are your three little bones, your ossicles. So obviously there can be some damage to your ear. There might be one of your ossicles may be missing. It may be that your ossicles or your, your bones have fused together. So instead of being three separate little bones, they've formed as one bone, which means that then the sound doesn't pass through in the way that we would like it to. Um, there may well be damage to your inner eardrum, so similar sorts of things to your outer eardrum. Then we're looking at your, your cochlea. So your cochlea, uh, there are some medical conditions which calcify your cochlea, which means that your cochlea, rather than being a sort of a soft, fleshy structure, it can become more like a bone um it sort of calcifies it so it almost sort of turns to stone which then means that it won't work in the way that we'd want it to there might be damage to the hair cells that are within your cochlea or the liquid there might not be enough liquid so anything that means that 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 cochlea doesn't work in the way that we'd want it to will cause um some sort of hearing loss or hearing impairment then obviously any damage to your auditory nerve. And we there are some people with a hearing loss where actually all the parts of their ear are working really well. So there's no issues with the ear canal or the bones or the cochlea. And actually there's issues with the auditory nerve. So all the information is not being passed up to the brain, again, in the way that we'd like it to. And that can sort of come out as, as, a, as a type of hearing loss. So if we're looking at the types of hearing loss, um, and it may be that you have an audiology report at home from your last visit to the clinic, and it says on there that you have a, a sensory neural loss, and you might not know really what that means. So I'm going to sort of try and explain that to you here. So with the sensory neural loss, it means that there's some sort of issue happening in your cochlea. So in your inner ear, in this 
structure here called your cochlea, there may be some sort of damage. So as I said previously, it may be that there are hair cells that are missing uh, or those hair cells are damaged. So when the sound comes through, all the sounds that those hair cells would have made and the information that would have been passed up to your brain isn't as it should be. It may be that the fluid is missing. So again, this causes the hair cells not to move in the way that we would want them to. And therefore, again, the information is not being passed up through the auditory nerve in the way that we'd want it to. And as I said previously, your auditory nerve, so this nerve here, which takes all that important information up to your brain, may not be working properly. So all the all the sound is coming in, it's doing all the things that it should be doing through your cochlea, all your hair cells are moving nicely. And then when those signals are sent to the auditory nerve, something goes wrong and that information isn't getting through properly. And that can mean that sometimes you can hear you're getting some of the information and not all of the information. What's really important to know about a sensory neural loss is that it will be a permanent hearing loss. So unfortunately, if there is damage to the cochlea, that isn't something that we can fix. Um, your body doesn't grow new hair cells. It won't replace the fluid. Um, it won't mend any issues that are happening with your auditory nerve. So that hearing loss <clears throat> is a hearing loss that you will take forward with you into adulthood. Um, on occasions, that hearing loss can get worse. We hope that it doesn't, but some people do experience um, an increased loss in their hearing as they get older. Um, but generally it will stay the same but what's important to know is that it won't improve so whatever hearing loss you have um it wouldn't it wouldn't get any better than that <clears throat> now if it says on your uh, audiology report that you have got a conductive loss a conductive loss um generally will be temporary so it doesn't last forever sometimes it can and it all, all depends on what causes your your conductive loss but generally it will improve now with a conductive loss as i said there's there's different reasons why that might happen and and it can fluctuate so fluctuate means that it can get better and worse so sometimes if you experience a cough or a cold and you've got a very runny nose and your ears are quite blocked you might find that your hearing loss slightly worsens now some of the reasons that a conductive loss may happen and one of the most common causes is glue ear so glue ear tends to happen when you're quite young so when you're a baby or a toddler but it can carry on through your primary years and occasionally you might still suffer from it when you're at secondary school. So what glue ear basically means is this middle part of your ear here where your little bones are, when you catch a cold and you're all snotty, this middle ear will fill up with fluid and all that gunk, similar to, to what runs out of your nose. <laughs> and what happens is, is that it doesn't clear away in the way that we'd like it to. So this little, Hit this little tube here that looks like a river it's called your eustachian tube so when you get bunged up generally what should happen is all that fluid should disappear down your eustachian tube and leave your ears nice and clear but unfortunately that doesn't happen for everybody and sometimes when you've had a cold or sometimes babies just sort of develop glue ear and then what happens is this middle part of the ear just fills up with fluid so then what happens is when the sound comes in through your ear canal it taps against your eardrum and instead of passing nicely through your three little ossicles your three little bones and off up to your cochlea the sound gets to the eardrum it hits that eardrum and it's like it's hit a wall and that sound just won't go any further because all that fluid in there is stopping those little bones from moving so that stops the sound from passing through
or it means that that sound has to be much, much louder to pass through the ear to get to the cochlea. So what we do know about uh, conductive loss is that the cochlea is fine and it's working how we want it to, but unfortunately we just can't get the sound to it. So, you know, so glue ear is one of the most common causes of a conductive hearing loss. The next thing for a conductive hearing loss is that there might be some damage to this outer part of your ear. So it's not collecting the sound how we'd like it to. Or it might be that there are some issues with the ear canal. So the ear canal may be very, very narrow. As I said before, there may not be an entrance here, so the sound can't come in. Um, and all of those will cause a conductive loss. Because again, what that means is your cochlea here is working fine, but we just can't get the sound to it. Conductive loss may also be caused by any damage that's happened to your to your ossicles, to your three little bones. Um, a perforated eardrum can cause a conductive loss. Um, but as I said, with a conductive loss, we would have a healthy cochlea. So it's all about the fact that we can't get the sound to the cochlea in the way that we'd like to. And that's when we look at the different types of hearing devices um, that people choose to use. So next we're going to look at an audiogram and you might have seen your audiogram. So I just want you to think about when you go to the clinic for a hearing test. Normally now at your age, secondary age, you would sit and you would have some headphones on and then the audiologist would send some sounds down those headphones. And when you whenever you hear a sound, you have to press a button and respond. So. What the audiologist is doing is he is creating or she is creating an audiogram. So this is an audiogram here. So there's a few things to look at here. We've got the loudness in decibels. So this is very, very quiet, going all the way through to really, really loud. So 120 decibels is really, really loud. And then we have pitch. So low, so low, right through to high. So very high sounds. So like any graph, we would plot your responses onto this graph. So the next thing to look at is this blue banana shape here. You can see and inside that banana are lots of letters. So this is called a speech banana. And all these letters here are speech sounds. So there the the pitch so if we look at the top part there the pitch and the decibel that we hear those different sounds within speech so these are sort of very low and loud sounds like like ah uh, or mm, are quite a loud but but low sound and then these much higher sounds like f and s and f a much quieter and softer and at much higher pitch. Um, so these are all sort of plotted onto this speech banana. So when you sit down um, and you do your test, the audiologist will plot onto the graph at what pitch and at what decibel you hear the different speech sounds. OK, and they'll create an audiogram just for you. And really what an audiogram is, is a sort of a picture of your hearing loss. And we'll have a look at that on the next slide. Um, but what's really important about an audiogram and why it's really important for you to sort of have a look at your own audiogram if you can, if you have access to one, is that it sort of shows you the sounds that you can hear very easily and the sounds that you find it much more difficult to hear. And it also explains why we prescribe hearing aids and what their job is and it's not just to make everything louder they have a very special job um, particularly now that we have digital hearing aids and we will talk about that but so your audiologist will create an audiogram just for you so 
what we're going to look at here is an, an audiogram for somebody that we would describe as having a moderate loss. OK, so when we're thinking about hearing loss, there's the different types of hearing loss. So there's the sensory neural hearing loss and a conductive hearing loss. But we also have different levels of hearing loss. So you might know that your hearing loss is a mild loss. It could be a moderate loss. It could be a severe loss. And that will include anyone who's got a high frequency loss. Or your hearing might be described as profound. So we'll have a, a talk about what they those are. So for normal hearing loss, your lines would be along here. So for normal hearing, we would say that you can hear most sounds, even very, very quiet sounds like leaves rustling, um, and that sort of thing. Now, with a with a mild loss, you're sort of looking at this area here. OK, now with a mild loss, you would really be able to hear most of speech um, if it was nice and quiet. But I know that when you're sitting in a classroom, even with a mild loss, that can really affect how well you can hear people talking, especially if there's sort of background noise. Then we start moving into sort of a moderate loss. So with a moderate loss, we would expect you to be wearing some sort of listening device, whether it's hearing aids or a bone conduction aid. Um, then we move on to a severe loss. With a moderate loss, there are parts of speech that you can hear. And I think with a moderate loss, it can be one of the com most confusing losses to have because there are some parts of speech that you can hear and there's other parts of speech which you can't hear, which we will look at a bit more closely in a moment. Um, and it's a very confusing one because you sort of re you think, well, I can hear everything because you can hear some of the sounds. But actually, there's often a lot that's that's missing. Now, with a severe hearing loss, we would expect that person to be wearing hearing aids. And without the hearing aids, they would have really struggled to hear speech, even when it's quiet. Now, with a profound loss, uh, for someone with a profound loss, we're looking at not being able to access very much useful sound. So if someone with a profound loss might hear something really, really loud, like somebody drilling in the street, like roadworks, that sort of thing. Or they might hear a really low flying aeroplane going over or something very close and very loud. But in terms of speech, with a profound loss, you would not be able to access speech without without cochlear implants but we will talk about cochlear implants but i just want to sort of look at this audiogram here so this audiogram is for somebody who has got a moderate hearing loss so they've obviously sat down they've had their hearing test and they've had to press the button every time the audiologist has played a sound into their headphones and then each time they respond the audiologist will plot that on a graph so if we look here we've got two lines we've got a red line and then we have a blue line. So the red line is what you can hear in your right ear. So red for right, r for r. And then the blue line is what you can hear in your left ear. So straight away we can see that your hearing loss or this person's hearing loss isn't the same in both ears. It's slightly different and that's very common. Um, it's less likely that you've got exactly the same hearing loss in both ears. And you might know yourself that you've got an ear that you prefer to listen through because maybe you hear a bit more through that ear. So some people have a favourite ear. So what I want to look at and what I want to explain to you is these two lines is that person in a clinic where it's nice and quiet, but without their hearing aids on. So they've taken their hearing aids or their listening device off and they're just listening with their ears. So what the important part is, is that what they can hear and what they can't hear. So on this graph, what they can hear is anything that is underneath these lines. So this person here would be able to hear these sounds in speech. They would be able to hear maybe a baby crying, dog barking, a motorbike, the phone ringing, those sorts of sounds without their hearing aids on. What they can't hear is all of this that is above the line. And it's really important to remember that, that you can hear what is below the lines, but you can't hear what is above the lines. So this person here with a moderate loss, 
is missing out on all of these parts of speech if they're not using their hearing aids. So when you go into school and you've decided not to wear your hearing aids today, this is potentially what you could be missing, all of this, okay? So now I want you to look at this green line. So this green line here is now this same person, but with their hearing aids on, okay? So you can see that their line has moved up, which means that what they can hear underneath the line has increased. So now this person can hear all of that part of speech, okay? Because their line has moved up, so now they can hear everything underneath that line. So now they should be able to hear a conversation, somebody talking to them, and they can hear all of this part of speech. Now, bearing in mind that this would be still with without any background noise what parts of speech they will still struggle to hear are these very soft high sounds like f okay and they're very easy to to lose those sounds in a conversation so if those sounds are missing and you can't hear those sounds then you're going to be missing parts of the information that's being given to you but now Technology is advancing all the time and, you know, audiologists can do lots of clever things now uh, with your hearing aids. Um, they can squash these sounds down a little bit to make them a lower sound, which makes them easier to access through your hearing aids. But this is all about using your hearing aid or using your listening device, whatever that might be. It's so important. So when you're a teacher of the deaf, if you've got a teacher of the deaf that visits you, or if you've got parents at home that are nagging you about wearing your hearing aids, this is why. Because this is what you can hear without them. But this is what you can hear with them. Okay, so we need to sort of really sort of think about that. Now, when we start looking at a severe loss, you know, we are looking at these two lines, your red and your blue line being down here somewhere. So obviously you can see that if your lines were going across the audiogram here, and we're thinking about what you can hear being underneath that line, then as you can see, they're quite a long way off being able to hear speech, which is why with a severe loss or a high frequency loss, it's vitally important that you are wearing whatever listening device you've been given. Um, because what that does will bring your lines up like this green one is here, it will bring your lines up the audiogram, giving you better access to speech and other sort of sounds. When we're looking at a profound hearing loss, now we're looking at the lines being right down here. So your red and blue line being right down here. So then if we look at the sort of sounds that you can hear without a listening device, you know, OK, as I said, it might be a very loud aeroplane going over or, you know, um, some machinery that's, you know, doing some roadworks or something. But in terms of speech, we would not with just normal hearing aids, we would not be able to get the hearing up this far to sort of reach the speech sounds, you know. So with a profound loss, that person may choose to use British Sign Language or some sort of sign language to communicate, or it may be that they opt for a different type of listening device called a cochlear implant. And um, we will look at that in some of the other parts of this, um, of my understanding of deafness. So if you do happen to have a copy of your audiogram, then just have a look at it and see whereabouts your hearing falls on that on that graph um, and have a look at the speech banana and remember you're looking to underneath the line what can you what can you hear underneath that line um, and think about whether you feel that you wear your hearing aids or your listening devices as often as you should do you know are you one of these people that thinks that you can get by with just wearing one and the other ones in your pocket or, you know, are you the person that goes, oh, I'm sorry, miss, I forgot today because I was running late, um, you know, but every time that happens, every time you're not using whatever device has been prescribed to you by the audiologist, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage. You're making it much more difficult 
to hear any information that's being given out um, you know and you can see that from your audiogram that's not me nagging that's not parents nagging that's not teachers nagging you know it's a fact it's there you can see it on your audiogram you can see what you can And just as we sort of come to the end of part one, I just want you to think about one thing that you could take away that maybe you feel that you've learned from this session. It might be something about the way that your ear works. It might be something about the importance of using your hearing aids. It might be that you found something out about the levels of hearing aid that you um, of hearing loss that you didn't know about or or whatever. But I just want you to sort of maybe think about one thing that you can take away from this part of the um the mud course please do go on and look at part there'll be four parts um in total so this is part one so in part two we'll be looking at mental health uh, which is important for everybody so please sort of take some time um to just go and have a look at that and thank you again for listening today thank you